Guys, I want to thank you all for tuning in. You know, it's been an honor to be a part of the VinWiki family and to watch this channel grow. And along with me, you know, I've never done YouTube before, before VinWiki. And I love, I love this channel and I've loved to watch it grow. So to celebrate 800,000 subs, we did a rabbit AMA. And, you know, ask me anything. I had to Google it actually at first to see what it was. When Ed told me, say, hey, Rob, you want to do an AMA? I Googled before I replied, yes. Um, Ask me anything, and you guys sure did. Uh, I tell you what, we got some great questions. I guess we need to roll on into them because we're going to be here for a little bit. Uh, you know, I got a lot of car-related questions. Probably, uh, probably the most questions were all about the car sales. A lot of them are. What was the highest profit on a deal you ever had? I sold a Prevost tour bus, and this thing was absolutely gorgeous. And this thing made me fall in love with these big tour buses. Like I always wanted to be a rock star, but I have no musical talent. So I guess I always want to travel like a rock star. Ever since I sold this tour bus, I have been in love with these things and currently looking at one right now. I made it. Actually, you know, and I made the most profit off of that, but it was also a very big ticket item. It was a $350,000 bus and I made a $40,000 profit off of it. So that was a pretty good, pretty good day's work. What would be your dream build? <sighs> That's so hard because I've got to build so many cars over the years and we really didn't touch on that. We talk about the flipping more here on Van Wick and things like that. But, you know, I've built 32 Fords. I've built, you know, hot rods. I've had 57 Chevrolets. I currently own a 57 Chevrolet. You know, all these iconic cars. And I, and I don't know. I mean, my dream builds whatever I see tomorrow that I want, you know? So it's really hard to say. That's another one. It's just hard to pin it down to one thing because for some reason I always find my way to find my next dream car. What is your favorite car you personally own? And I get asked this a lot. I do my questions on Instagram and things like that. And I get asked that a lot. And it always comes back down to one car. It's probably the least expensive vehicle I own, as far as the muscle car stuff, is my 1965 Malibu SS. I call it the boo thing. Um, a funny story with how it's got its name. This car came out of Atlanta, and uh, it was built in Atlanta, sold new in Atlanta, and restored in Atlanta. And I bought it from a guy that was an older gentleman that was a father-son project, and him and his son restored it. And uh, I bought the car as a flip. And it was kind of like a pretty woman kind of thing, you know, like I was Richard Gere and the boo thing was Julia Roberts and I fell in love with it and it was happily ever after. I've had the car for five years now and I've had numerous people try to buy it and I'll price it way out of the market every time because that's just that one car that's just so fun to drive. It's not the nicest collector car I own. It's not the most valuable by any stretch but it's just that car that you can jump in and have fun with. And I think that's why Ed likes like the higher mileage Lambos or the Lambos with a bad deed because you can drive them and enjoy them. I mean, if you know a bug hits the windshield on it or if it sprinkles rain on it, I just keep driving. I mean, you just have a great time with it. And it's a fun car. What is your opinion on your current muscle car lineup? Uh, we've got some pretty neat cars right now. We've got a lot of Camaros in. Uh, I've got 369 Camaros in the shop right now. i got my 72 C10 Big Block. Uh, got a lot of neat stuff. I got my Black Widow 57 I bought the other month. What is your best car horror story? The one I haven't sold. That scares the hell out of me. Nothing with a car scares me. I've had every situation in the world come up from, you know, bad engines, bad transmissions, bad paperwork, stolen cars, whatever. None of that bothers me selling them. Not selling a car scares the hell out of me. So, so that would probably be my horror story with a car. The longest I ever sat on a car, maybe a month. Maybe a month in back in the retail days. And the collector cars, you hang on to them a little more because of the way the market is. And those cars don't move as fast as normal retail cars do. What cars do you currently own? We're going to be here all damn day. I mean, between service vehicles and the muscle cars and all that stuff, a lot. Uh, go to my IG page, there's pictures of everything on there. You know, a few of my favorites, of course, my 1965 Malibu SS, my Black Widow 57 Chevrolet that I just got, we call it the Voodoo Doll, my 1972 Big Block Sierra Grande Barrett Jackson C10 that I absolutely love, uh, I call it the Dime Piece. Um, you'll ever notice the cars that I really, really like, I always give them a little nickname. So that's always usually a telltale that that's the one that's going to be a keeper for a little while for me. What new car would you like to buy today? 
You know, that's a good question. You know, I mean, I drive a late model Silverado as a daily and I like it. I've always been a truck guy, but, uh, you know, I don't know if I was going out and buying a new car, I don't know what I would buy. I've never been much on cars themselves. You know, like I said, I mean, a pickup truck's a utility for me. I use it to pull trailers or whatnot, but as far as like a car, I don't know what I would buy. I'd have to sit and think about it. It'd have to be something fun though, for sure. What is the oldest car you ever sold? Sold a 1923 T-Bucket. And actually, it was hot rodded, so it wasn't like, you know, with a tall top or anything like that. It was all cut up Model T. It was actually a pretty cool little car. What is the worst car you ever sold? Ed sent me these questions last night, and I was reading through them. And when I read this question, the first thing that popped in my mind was a car that my dad actually bought. Back in my eBay heyday, you know, I was selling cars for other car lots, but I was also buying cars and going to night sales and auctions all over the place and buying cars. I'd go, I'd go buy cars anywhere to let me in. I loved it. And my dad, you know, like I said before in previous videos, we're more like brothers than father and son. So it's always a competition. And uh, we were at the night sale one night, me and my dad, I mean, I brought him with me. I thought maybe he could drive a car back. And... We're walking around the sale. Well, I saw a really nice turbo Volvo coming through the auction line. And they had three lines going through at this particular sale. And there was a really nice caravan that caught my eye. I said, hey, if the miles are right on the caravan, everything seems okay. Let's try to get it bought. So I sent my old man to buy the caravan while I was going to watch the turbo. Because the cars were going through two different lines. I got this. I can buy anything. My old man as he is. So sure enough, I got the turbo Volvo bought. And I walked around to the other side of the auction. My dad said, boy, I stole that little caravan. I bought it for $1,100. Now, keep in mind, this caravan was probably seven years old, had less than 100,000 miles on it, and was a very good-looking caravan. Like, I remember it just like it was yesterday. It was bright white, and it had tan leather interior with the Infinity sound system and keyless entry, and it had the power sliding doors and every button you could throw at it. It was a good-looking van and sitting knee deep in brand new good years. And I'm like, man, the old man did steal this van. Well, we bought a few more cars that night and I left the caravan, the title wasn't in for the caravan yet, so I just left it there. Um, we drove a few more cars that I bought back. So I decided the next day to go pick up the caravan. So I grabbed a rollback, thank God, and we drove over to the cell to pick it up. And, uh, you know, I walked into the business office and I showed her my receipt. She handed me the key to the car. I walked to the back and I got in the van and I went to crank it up. And I thought I heard a tick when I cranked it up, but you know, I didn't think nothing about it. And it was pulled into a parking spot with nothing in front of it. So I dropped it in gear and just pulled straight through and thought I heard a little tick, but yeah, it could be exhaust leak. You know, it can't be that bad. So I'm pulling it out and pulling around and I already let the bed back on the rollback. And so I was just going to go ahead and pull it on around. And when I turned around to drive up on the rollback, I overshot it. So I was going to back up so I could pull up on the rollback. Well, when I went to put it in reverse, it didn't have reverse. Mad at this point because the tick is getting louder and I have no reverse in this awesome van that my dad just bought. I drop it in gear and just gun it and drive over the rail on the rollback, blow out a tire on it. Finally get it up on the rollback, throw a strap on it so this piece of shit doesn't fall off the back. I come back to the shop with it. We crank it up. It starts running hot. It's rattling even more now. Old 3.8 Dodge. Um, transmission shot in it. Transmission fluid looks like tar in it. Um, and this thing still had great miles. I don't know what they were doing with this thing. And it was the biggest turd. And I ended up selling it. I made like $200 off of it. And uh, the craziest thing ever is the guy came all the way from Raleigh, North Carolina to Greenville, South Carolina to buy this thing. And I made it very clear to him that this van, I would not recommend driving it far. And, you know, I told him that it didn't go in reverse or anything. This guy got in this van, put it in reverse, and it backed out of the space it was in. It blew my mind. Apparently the van didn't like me and it must've liked him, but it backed out. I don't know if it was the good Lord pushing this thing, getting it out of my life or what, but I was glad to see it gone. I'll take that little profit. Oatmeal's better than no meal. So that's definitely the crappiest car I ever sold by far. First memorable experience you had with a car. Oh, so many fun ones, so many fun ones. You know, the story about the Trans Am. My first date in the Trans Am. 
and this is a really funny story, and, 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 and the person that involves is gonna see this and she's gonna laugh, and I'm gonna get a text for this. Um, I worked at a grocery store in high school. It was right across the street from the high school. And here I had a brand new Trans Am sitting in the parking lot at the grocery store. There was a girl that I went to school with that was not the cutest girl in the world, but she was really nice and very flirty. And I was oblivious to any of this. And she used to leave notes on my windshield. And I thought, oh, she's just being nice. And, uh, she finally asked me out on a date, and I remember picking her up in my Trans Am. Now, this is a straight up true story. Um, we went out on one date, and I was scared to death. Scared to death. Um, we went on a date, and we, and we were always friends afterwards. She's married now. She's actually, she's actually a heart surgeon now. And, uh, you know, I've, several times in my life, I wish I could go back and maybe give it another shot. I probably should have looked into that one a little further. But old Rob was a little shallow back in his younger days, I guess. Um, but yes, that was probably one of my first most memorable experiences in a car was my first date uh, in the Trans Am. That was actually a lot of fun. It wasn't a wild date. We didn't break the Trans Am in or anything like that. I hate to let you all down, but it wasn't that great. Which Ferrari is the best Ferrari? Um... I think Ed could answer this best for me because we joke around. We'll send texts back and forth. Um, I love Ferrari Daytonas. I think they're absolutely gorgeous cars, even though they're huge turds and everyone knows it. Um, I think I just like Miami Vice. So my favorite Ferrari is the Ferrari from Miami Vice, which is not even a real Ferrari. So I guess which Ferrari is the best Ferrari is probably the one sitting in Ed's garage because I don't have to mess with it. Does Rabbit go on any rallies, events, or any particular car shows he enjoys visiting with, like SEMA, etc.? I go to SEMA every year. Um, big, big, big part of SEMA. I love it. I work with several large companies out there, so I help with promotional stuff. And of course, with a radio show. You know, we do radio interviews for, you know, later show dates and things like that with all the Discovery Channel guys and Motor Trend Channel guys. We have a lot of fun with it. That's the busiest five days ever. We hit the ground running when we're in Vegas and the show's only four days and uh, we're, it's nonstop. I mean, we're walking, you know, eight, 10 miles a day while we're there, but it's a blast. And the after parties are awesome. If you ever get the opportunity to go to SEMA, you need to be there. Hey Rob, what's the worst mechanical failure you ever had to deal with on a vehicle you flipped or owned? Um, in the collector car business, you can't be scared to spend a little bit of money to make your money. So I guess repairs, I mean, I don't look at them like, you know, a failure, a mechanical failure. I mean, it's just kind of par for the course with the collector car stuff. Between 88, 94, and 95, and 98, OBS trucks, which is your favorite? Man, I love all OBS Chevrolet trucks. Um, you know, if you want to talk about your 88 through 94s, I love the early SS trucks, you know, your 454 trucks. You know, those trucks are always great. They're going crazy in value right now. And now just nice short bed trucks are. Um, if I had to pick my favorite though, most creature comforts, probably better truck, probably the later your Vortec trucks are my favorite after the 454 SSs. Money, no object. What's your dream car? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. It's like, I love so many cars. I mean, there's way more I like than I don't like. So asking me what my dream car is just depends on what day of the week it is or what I saw that I want now. You know, my friends, I'll, I'll text them something like, man, you see this? And then the next day it'll be a Prevost bus or a Ferrari Daytona McBurney kit or, you know, a Volkswagen bug or whatever. I'm all over the spectrum. Right now, I really, really want Motley Cruise tour bus. That's what I want. That's my current dream vehicle. I'd like to hear some updates on the mini truck. Well, you know what you want to update on the mini truck? I got you an update on the mini truck. Um, I don't even own it anymore. And uh, so that's a pretty big surprise, I'm sure, for everybody. We actually started working on the truck, and we got a lot of work done on it. And because of all you guys, when it was sitting in the body shop, there was people actually coming in the body shop. And it was like they were walking in there taking pictures of this thing. And so, like, half of it was at my house and half of it was at the body shop. Um, I had to find a new bed for it. And, you know, finding parts for a 92 Mitsubishi Mighty Max aren't as easy as you think it would be. Those things have all rotted away or been beat to death. And I had to locate a new bed for it. I had the engine rebuilt for it. Um, I did a lot of work to it. And it was, you know, kind of in the middle of the body shop. 
And uh, Josh, the guy from the video, uh, that actually went and looked at the truck originally for me, um, his son, him and his son are really big into mini trucks. And Josh and, and his wife, Bree, helped me with the event company and the radio show. And we're sitting in the studio, and Josh was like, man, I've got to get my son's grades up. He said, I got to get something for him to get focused on. And Josh has got a gorgeous Silverado show truck, this beautiful Air Ride 22s, the whole shooting match. And he said, I'm going to find a project for my son. His son's 14 years old. And he said, I want to find a project and get him interested in it and have something like, hey, you keep your grades up. We'll keep working on this. And this is yours. And uh, so we're sitting in the studio. And the more he thought about it, I thought about all the projects that me and my dad did together and me and my grandfather did together. And I'm like... You like the Meth Bus Mini? He said, man, I love that truck. I said, good, you can have it. Um, and I gave it to him. And now they're currently building it, finishing it, and we'll have pictures, and we'll do an update video and, and all that good stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, I love to make a dollar. But if you're my friend, I love you. And his kids are awesome. I mean, they come with me to car shows. I'm like Uncle Rob. And the way I look at it, that mini truck's cool. But if it can help that kid get his grade straight, and put him on the right path and help him build some memories with his dad, you know what? There's not an amount of money in the world I could make to equal the pride it gives me to know that I helped with that. So there's what the Myth Bus Mini is now. What was the first car you ever flipped? I always get asked what my first car is, and of course we know it was a Trans Am. The first car I ever flipped, though, and I've been asked this only a couple times out of all the times, it was a 1979 Mustang. V6, um, I bought it for $400 and doubled my money on it the next week. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And it's been downhill ever since. Do you like BMWs? No, I'm not the biggest BMW fan. And before all you M guys get up and start hating, the reason that I'm not a big fan of BMWs is where I live. I live in Greenville, South Carolina. They build BMWs in Greer, South Carolina, which is literally the next town over. And BMWs are like Honda Accords in Greenville. So they're everywhere. So a BMW is not as special to me. And I mean, I know there's some gorgeous and some very fast and some very nice BMWs out there, but they're just everywhere. And I'll be honest with you, they just don't really blow my skirt up. Cheapest way to do a high-speed cross-country run. Well, hell, on an airplane would be the cheapest. But uh, the fun is to be like a, a Corvette or cool sports car. Definitely. And, and, you know, hell, cheapest. Get you a C4 Corvette and do it. I think that'd be a lot of fun. All these guys are doing it with C7 Corvettes. What car are you most surprised as becoming an investment? And what are you surprised that hasn't been worth anything? Um, you know, I was really shocked when I started seeing the Japanese cars. And, you know, I know the Skylines and things like that have always held their value well. But what the Z cars are doing now, the early Zs, and how, like the Acura Integras, and the early cars, how these cars are really bring, bringing great money now. I never would have thought in a million years that, that these cars that the chicks drove in high school would be valuable cars. So that one really shocked me. And I mean, I probably should have saw it coming, but there again, I don't exactly follow the whole JDM thing as close as I probably should. But that one, that one definitely shocked me. Cars that I'm surprised with that aren't really worth nothing. I'll tell you one. It's like the Impala SS's. Uh, your, what, 94 through 96 Impala SS's. Like, those are really cool cars. And uh, you can still buy them extremely cheap. I always liked them. And I never understood how they haven't took off yet. But maybe, maybe give them a little bit of time. Thoughts on the upcoming mid-engine Corvette. And I've been asked this one quite a bit also. I'm a vet purist. I'm old school Corvette. You know, my dad's had Corvettes my entire life. I've owned several, several Corvettes over the years. And I'm really, really weird. Like when the C6 C6 Vets came out and they got away from the hideaway headlights, I didn't like that. When they changed the taillights on the Vets, I didn't like that. And now they're just totally rewriting the whole script on this car, making it a mid-engine. Now, be try they've been trying to do this. They've been talking about it for 40 years, but now they're actually really doing it. But I'm just kind of old school, so I'm on the fence. I mean, it might be a great car, and I'm sure, you know, weight distribution and all that, it's a better setup. But on the other hand, I'm kind of old school. I like to stick to the roots a little bit, and I think they're straying away from the plan a little too far. But, hey, who knows? It might be the best Corvette ever made. How many cars have you totaled, and what was the first one? I have never totaled a car in my life. 
knock on wood. Um, so I don't have one at all. I don't even have a good story to go with that. Um, I bought several totaled cars and fixed them and sold them. But no, personally, I've never totaled a vehicle in my life. What do you think is your craziest, best car story? Um, probably, I don't know about crazy. And I don't even know about best. But probably the funnest one to talk about and the funnest one to do was the one about me and my dad. And uh, I love it because me and my dad, like I said before, and I say it all the time, we're like brothers. My dad shows up in my shop every day. We argue nonstop. And it's, you know, it's constant. I mean, and, and you know, like me and my dad talk to each other, not like a father and son normally talk to each other. And anybody that hangs around us much will notice it pretty quick. You know, I mean, like, you know, I haven't seen my dad in two days all weekend long. And I come in Monday morning, he's standing there. And I'm like, I just walk straight up to him and say, I'll kick your ass. And and that's just how we communicate. I mean, that's how we are. You know, I mean, my family puts a D in disturbed, but hey, it works. What's your advice for working sales on a used car lot? I start in two weeks. Thank you. You know, I get this question quite a bit. Guys are wanting to get into sales or guys that are already in sales or new to sales. And, um, you know, a lot of these are no brainer things, you know, they, there's sales books and there's books on selling everywhere. Um, I've never been a big reader of all that kind of stuff and all that. I've always kind of winged it. But, um, something I've noticed is when you make yourself stick out in a dealership, you know, like when I was working at the Ford dealership, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, that's back when dress casual was was becoming a really big thing. And so everybody had on their golf shirt and their khaki pants. And when they're pressed and your golf shirt's clean, it does look presentable. But then people start kind of getting lax and they just grab the shirt out of their dryer and, you know, their khaki pants, they're never been pressed or anything like that. And, and, and you know, the thing you got to understand is buying a car. And I don't want to get cheesy with this, but you realize that most, most Americans... A car is the second largest purchase they ever make next to a home. And so, you know, it's kind of, they're downplaying it by everybody's dress casual. So dress your part. I'm not saying you need to be dressed like a preacher, but, you know, a nice dress shirt, a tie. You know, you know, you may not be the sales manager, but you can look like the sales manager. And, and that's the thing. You know, a lot of times if you look the part, it really helps. And also, you know, when you're the best looking guy there, I'll be honest with you, it's a self-esteem boost. Um, so that keeps you going because that's another thing. You know, you got to stay in your zen. You know, you're sitting there and you know you're starving to death and no customers are coming in. But you got to keep yourself happy because if, you know, if your mood starts drifting off and you do get a customer, it reflects. And uh, so you got to stay, you know, in your zen, in your positive spot, you know, and and uh, in the zone, I guess you would be. And uh, so that's something I tell people all the time, you know, you dress for success. I think it's a big thing. I think that was the biggest reason that I did well at the Ford dealership. I really do. I had people come up to me all the time. Nobody wore tie in that dealership, but I did. And, you know, I wore, you know, starch dress, you know, dress pants. And I always wore a nice starch dress shirt. And, you know, and of course I had a gold ring on every finger, but that was a whole nother ball game. But that's the thing. When you walk up, you, you demand attention, you know, and, you know, you're not selling a Ford. You're this guy that's selling him his, I mean, this is like a major purchase for them. So, you know what? You make it, you make yourself look important. You make the sale important and you make the sale. So I think that's really a big thing is dress for success. And I think that gets downplayed a lot, but I think it's really important. What's the one car deal that you couldn't put together no matter how hard you tried? You know, I had a few that were, you know, that I had to work really hard to get. But, and not, not to brag or toot my own horn or anything like that, but if they came to buy, I was selling them a car. I never really had too many times when somebody left and the opportunity was there and I didn't take it. Um, you know, I wasn't scared to push it, you know, kind of like the fusion guy, you know, and his wife there with the uh, cubic zirconia engagement ring or, you know, just, you know, going the extra mile. I mean, I did what it take, what it took to make the sale. I mean, like selling the Dodge truck, you know, I spent all day with that guy 
but I got the deal done. And I think that's another big thing is, you know, sales, everybody thinks, well, they test drive the car and then they sit down in your office and you're doing paperwork. There's a lot more to it than that. You're building a relationship with that person. And then you got to, you got to, you know, tackle that hurdle. And now you go over to how they're going to pay for it. And, you know, talking to somebody into buying a car is nothing. You know, a new shiny car, I mean, they sell themselves. Getting the financing and getting all that done and building that relationship with that person and making them feel comfortable with you. That's what actually closes the deal. The car is just a byproduct. And that's the thing you got to understand. And I tell people this all the time with that. I mean, there were some deals that, you know, we might have could have got some better financing in there for them or something like that. And I had some people come in to the dealership before that they were buried in their car that, you know, some dealership, you know, killed them on their trade and they were upside down and they were fixing to get rolled over again. And matter of fact, that was one of the biggest reasons I got out of new car sales because I saw the recession literally coming when we started getting letters in the mail that finance companies were financing, you know, 120 and 130 percent of vehicle value just to cover negative equity. And I'm like, dude, you can only do this so many times. And I'm like, ugh. You know, numbers were starting to slow down a little bit, so I jumped ship before that baby went out. How did you meet the VinWiki guys? Well, I don't know about the VinWiki guys. I met the VinWiki guy. Actually, kind of a cold call. Um, I, I don't even know exactly what I was doing when I messaged him. We just started the radio show, and uh, we wanted a really good call-in guest, and we wanted someone from the Southeast. And... Uh, you know, we're, we're scrolling around and I came across Ed's video on YouTube from the Today Show and Matt Lauer was interviewing him and they were talking and, and I'm like, this dude's in Atlanta. This would be a great guy for my radio show. And me and a buddy of mine were sitting in an Italian restaurant in Greer, South Carolina when I messaged Ed for the very first time and he was our very first calling guest on our radio show. And uh, I mean, literally, I knew nothing about radio at all. You know, I mean, I had like six weeks of very informal training and, and we just kind of went with it and it's took off and it's done phenomenal. But and he was my very first calling guest. And uh, the next thing you know, you know, we, we hear about the car stories and we start talking about that. And I end up in a cold warehouse one December day in Atlanta and uh, the rest is history. So have you ever got scammed on a deal like the Mexican Stig? Um, I have been scammed. Um, one that really sticks out in my mind, and this was actually back in my eBay days. Um, there was a preacher here in Georgia, uh, I'm not going to say the town, that bought a car for me, and he sent me a fake certified check. And uh, that, was, that, that deal was running rampant across eBay on big ticket items. And what they would do is they would mail you the check, and before the check cleared, they would already have the car picked up and transported. And uh, you never met them in person. That was a big catch. Like, you know, it wasn't like, hey, here's the check. Now here's my key and I leave. It was never face to face. So you never really knew exactly who you were dealing with. And uh, I got this check and just by dumb luck, um, he FedExed me the check and he actually sent me a message saying, hey, I mailed you the check, but I think I missed the cutoff date. You'll get it the next day. And I actually got it the day he originally intended. So I got the check a day early. And sure enough, we run it through and I got the information back earlier. The, didn't lose the car. He went ghost, turned everything into white collar crimes back home and they took care of it from there. So at least I didn't lose the car, but that could have potentially been pretty bad. How has VinWiki helped you in business? I don't know. It eats a lot of my time. Um, being a YouTuber, you watch a lot of YouTube, and I never did before I started doing this. And now I watch other people's YouTube channels, and I've made all kinds of buddies on YouTube and stuff. But um, one instance where it really helped, you know, I own a diesel truck shop in Greenville, and my grandfather started it, and I love it. That's... That, that, that business is my heart. I love sales, but this is family. This is a whole nother ball game. And, you know, so I'm running this shop and, you know, I love going out and seeing customers and telling them about all the great things that my truck shop has to offer and me being a salesman. I love that part of it. So I love going out and seeing new customers or going out and talking to companies or whatnot. And, uh, 
I was actually walked into a major, 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 major construction company, and they had several dump trucks and things like that. So I'm talking to their head guy, and we're going back and forth, and we're sitting there at his desk, and he's got his phone in his hand. And he keeps looking at me, and he looks down at his phone, and he looks at me. And I'm over here telling him, we do this, and we got this, and we do this, and no, oh, we also do this. And he's just like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I said, what are you looking at? Like, I just had to know. You know, he goes, is this you? And it was a picture of his kid with a rabbit shoes car shirt on. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. And uh, he goes, my son freaking loves you, dude. And I got an account that day. So that actually worked out pretty good. Uh, that was kind of neat. And took some pictures with his kid. So it made, it made his day. So that was kind of fun. When will you tell us a story about the firm lecture you got at the Ford dealership about straw deals? Uh, what's the best way to be Vin Wiki friendly about this? I was in his office, Skip Davenport, and he came in and Skip was not a really big man. And keep in mind, the amount of cars I sold, I could get away with literally anything I wanted in that dealership. But Skip was a little heated, him and the finance manager, about the things I was doing to get this certain vehicle financed. And so he, he uh, we had a come to Jesus meeting in his office and it slowed me down on my extra, extra, extra help with financing um, a little bit. But um, I was never scared to push the envelope at the dealership. Um, I was never scared to, to, to you know, do whatever it took to sell because that's what a salesman does. Weirdest trade offer. You know, I've got offered some crazy stuff in trade. A really, really funny one. I bought a Ford F-150 base model V6 and uh, just, a, just a work truck, a white 4.2 V6 work truck and uh, really clean, low miles, and I had it for sale. And I had some of the weirdest trades offered to me on that. I mean, like nobody wanted to pay for it. Everybody wanted to trade you something for it and ended up trading for something really good for it. Um, I mean, it was a clean little truck and it was low miles, but it was just a base model V6 long bed pickup truck. I had a guy offer me a boat for it. We have a company in Greenville that sells amusement park rides, and they were interested. He offered me a tilt-a-whirl for the Ford truck. And although that was tempting, because I thought that'd be kind of cool to put in my front yard just to piss my neighbors off, I didn't take that up. But I ended up having a guy from Aldi grocery stores. He did all the maintenance in the Aldi grocery stores, like changing light bulbs and like light duty stuff. But he drove this big F-250 truck. And it was like a 97 F-250. And this is like a 2002 F-150. And it was, a, I mean, four-wheel drive. It was a gas F-250, but a nice extended cab four-wheel drive F-250. And I got a thousand bucks in that truck for that V6 truck because it was good on gas because he traveled so much working on the Aldi grocery stores. So that one actually worked out. I ended up selling the F250 to my neighbor who has it to this day. And that was 10 years ago. So that was actually kind of cool. Craziest item someone has left in a car you bought. I'm trying to think the best way to describe this. I know what I would say if we were in a bar. I don't know what I would say, like, you know, if we were, like, whispering it in public. What's the word they use for that now? Personal massager. Rubber gloves. Out. Yeah, that's not, it wasn't a flashlight. How did you build up the capital to be able to purchase vehicles? You know... When you got the sales bug, you'll sell anything. And I'm not saying you'll sell dope or whatever, but you'll sell anything. And I was that guy, you know, when I was working at the grocery store, when I was working at, you know, AutoZone, and when, I mean, like selling the used oil and cleaning up cars after school. That's how I did. I saved my money. I always stacked my money up. Like, literally, it was gas. Sure as hell wasn't going on a lot of dates. I was kind of fat. So I stacked my money up and I started buying cars. And, uh, you know, like I said, I bought that 79 Mustang and, you know, and from there more cars and more stuff. And next thing you know, you got a little capital up and you can actually buy some cars. So yeah, you're saving, you know? And I mean, that was, that was the big thing. I mean, we're really a secret to it. What's the craziest car deal or even sales deal you've ever had? I've heard some good ones. 
But what's the cherry on top sale that is the most unbelievable? I'm probably the most proud of the x-ray machine. And I know everybody laughs and all that stuff. And, and no, it didn't go to a terrorist, you know. But I enjoyed, like, I enjoy selling things that nobody can't sell. You know, like, like the C-10 truck. You know, that had the guy's name painted on the side of it. You know, I love being that guy. Rusty comes to me and says, hey, I can't sell this x-ray machine. Guess what? I can. And I love that. So I'm a little proud of that one because that's got to be a small circle of people that has sold an x-ray machine. If you were 22 again, how would you go about starting out flipping cars? You know, I don't think I'd do it any different. You know, I mean... The eBay thing was a bad thing, and I understand that. And that was kind of a pitfall a little bit, but I learned a lot from my mistakes, and it helped hone my craft. And, and I know a lot of people are going to roll their eyes when I say that. You know, this old salesman talking about a craft, but there is skill in sales. Never let no one downplay your profession. And, and, and a salesman is a profession. Sales is a very important profession. Um, without salesmen, there wouldn't be anything. I probably wouldn't change anything because I think all the circumstances and all the pitfalls and all the, the crazy stories is what made me the salesman I am today. So probably wouldn't change a thing. I don't know. I may call the heart surgeon back. Maybe. Because I don't think she was married yet. But anyway. What's some good advice for selling cars on eBay? Um, you know, I'm probably not the best one to ask for this. Um, of course, everybody knows the eBay outlaw story, you know, and I'm permanently banned from eBay. There's actually a guy writing a book right now who's a, was an executive for eBay, and he contacted me, and I'm mentioned in the book twice. So I thought that makes me feel kind of cool that I'm still kind of relevant in eBay history. But, um, so that's kind of neat. But no, I'm probably not the best person for that, but I'll be honest with you. Ebay car sales are kind of off right now. I don't hear anybody bragging about what cars are doing on eBay anymore. There's so many different better sites and better ways to sell cars. Um, certain things probably still do okay on eBay. Like I said, I don't really play on it too much. If a witch, a single mom, and a porn star walk onto the lot, who do you help first? Well, why run down and help one when you can walk down and help them all? I mean, hell. I mean, this is the thing, you know, you treat the porn star like a lady, you treat the single mom like the porn star, and you treat the witch, well, you treat her nice because you don't want her to put a spell on you. So I guess that's probably how I'd handle that and probably try to put all three of them riding. Here's, here's one that I was actually looking forward to get. What's the most you ever lost flipping a car? And nobody's going to believe this. No one's going to believe it. I have never technically lost on a car, ever. I've had some I broke even on. I've had some I had to drive a little while, but I sold them for what I had in them. I have bought vehicles before that I've had to literally sell everything out of the inside of them that was left in them to clear a profit, but I still profited off of it. I have never technically lost on a vehicle, and that blows a lot of people's minds, but like, if you remember back in one of my early, I don't even remember which story it was, we was talking about I bought a, uh, a van that was full of satellite boxes. And the only way I profited on it was from the satellite boxes. But I still didn't lose. And I had some that, like I said, I drove them for a little while and I sold it for what I had in it. Or I had some that I just broke even and I sold for what I had in it. But I've never technically lost on a vehicle, ever. When was the first moment in selling cars and stuff where you thought, man, I'm really good at this? I was reading this question last night and, you know, you start thinking back in my younger days and uh, probably my earliest memory of selling cars, and this was before the Camaro or the 79 Mustang, um, my dad had a car lot and we had a 94 Lincoln Town Car. It was white with navy blue leather interior. And uh, it was a salvage title car, carbon rear-ended. And uh, we had we repaired it. And I'll never forget, we were riding around, and my dad was talking to someone on the lot, and an older couple came out to look at it. Um, and they wanted to test drive it. And here I am, I'm 14, 15 years old. I mean, the car was almost brand new. Um, 
and I was sitting in the back seat going on a test drive with them. And I was telling them all about this car. And I, you know, hell, I barely drove a car. And I'm telling them all about it. And uh, they ended up buying it. And I'm like, damn, I'm pretty good at this. So uh, I think that was one of the first times. And then shortly after, I got a little capital up and I bought the first car and it's been downhill ever since. Most dangerous car deal you ever made. I've been to some shady places to buy cars. I've been to some shady places to deliver cars. Um, probably the most scared I've ever been dealing with a car deal is I had a lady that was wanting to sell a car. And I bought a lot of cars from individuals. And she lived in an apartment complex on the west side of Greenville, which is kind of the rougher side of Greenville. And, uh, and at the time, it was extremely rough. And uh, she had a Ford Taurus there that her mother left to her when she passed away, and she wanted to sell it. And I remember making the deal with her on this car and watching people, like, dealing drugs, like, one car over from us. And I'm thinking the whole time, if I don't get stabbed and get this Taurus home, it's going to be, like, a friggin' miracle. But yeah, that's probably the most scared I've ever been buying or selling a car is this shady apartment complex. And literally, like when we had Life PD in Greenville, they were there like every four minutes when they came to Greenville. So uh, definitely a rough neighborhood and probably wouldn't go back there again, even for the best tourists in the world. Have any of your clients from your stories ever seen these videos? And if yes, what was their reaction? Big damn fan. Thanks for watching. Uh, yes, several people have, actually. Um, the lady I sold the van to, she loves it. She thought it was absolutely epic. Her kids have a YouTube channel. So uh, they're kind of all into the YouTube thing. Um, the guy I sold the Patina 69C10 truck to, his son found it and showed his dad. His parents loved it. They thought it was hilarious. Um, you know, the Brick Mason. He's seen the truck, the Dodge truck, the grandma's got credit story. He thought it was absolutely hilarious. Um, so several people have seen them and they've all liked them, you know, and they've seen them, you know, for the funny part of it. You know, we're not here to talk trash about anybody. You know, we're just having fun and we're joking around. How did you get that buttery smooth voice? Well, it's not from drinking milk, I promise you. Um, years of smoking, years of being in smoky comedy clubs, um, Lots of coffee, lots of late nights, lots of stress. This gave me this voice that has been compared to some of the best descriptions of it I've ever read. Was My voice was like Morgan Freeman and Sam Elliott had a baby. And honey poured over gravel. That's, that one still gets me. But yes, um... Everything your mother told you not to do is what gave me this voice, basically. And uh, because my mom told me the same things. Rabbit, how did you manage to fight off all the ladies with your suave self? Believe it or not, that's not that big of a problem for me. Um, I know I let on like the ladies, man, and all that stuff, but it's really, really not that big of a deal. Um, I'm a pretty smooth talker, but um, after that, it kind of drops like a rock. How many wives have you had? I've been married twice. I was married for five years the first time. I was married for nine months the second time. Um, a funny story with that. When I got divorced the first time, I was down in the dumps. And my attorney is one of my best friends. I grew up with him. And uh, I'll never forget, I was sitting in his office. And I was all down in the dumps. I mean, I'm 25 years old. You know, my world's coming to an end. You know, me and my wife, I'm getting a divorce. I'll never forget, I'm sitting in his chair in his office, and, you know, and he had the leather chairs like this, and I'm sitting there, and I got my head down. He just pats me on the back real hard. He says, Rob, chill out, brother. He said, man, everybody's getting divorces now. He said, hell, I'll give you a third one for free. Well, I came back in the second time for my second divorce, and he told me, he said, you know I was bullshitting with you about that third one for free. So we laughed. and uh, my. But another funny tidbit with the divorce thing is, the guy that served my first wife with papers is a really close friend of mine, too, who ran a limo service. And he used to hang out at my shop all the time. And so we needed somebody to serve papers. And James was always available. 
So I sent James over to serve her with papers. And in the few years in between my marriages, James found the Lord and became an ordained minister. And uh, he actually married me and my second wife. So James is a very, very useful guy. And at the time when he married me, he also catered my wedding because he also had a barbecue business. And he was also a licensed mortician at the same time. And he was still driving a limo on his off nights. So this guy had the hustle like no other. We definitely need to get James on Van Wiki. He's definitely got some great stories too. Your witticism, your, is this even a word? Your witticism, witticisms just roll off the tongue. Have you always had the gift or has years of filling time on radio honed it? Radio's helped, but I've always been witty. Um, I've always been real quick. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've heard this several times before, you know. A lot of people tell me that I got a tongue like a razor blade because I can cut you so quick and you don't even realize it. Um, and I think stand-up comedy is what helped me with that. Um, because, you know, working different clubs in different places, certain jokes work, certain jokes bomb. So you got to be pretty quick to turn that around. And uh, so I think, I think the, the years of stand-up comedy not only helped me with this deep voice, but it also helped me with my wit a little bit. How many times have you been in the jailhouse for any reason to bail out or be bailed out, etc.? I've never been in jail. I've always been on this side of the bars. I have bailed a few buddies out over the years. Um, but no, I've, I've never never been to the Gray Bar Motel. So that's a good thing. I'm going to try to stay. I've made it 40 years without going to jail. So I think I'm going to stay there. Stay on this side of the bars. How does rabbit function? <laughs> what is the day-to-day -day in the life of the rabbit? Well, I wear a lot of hats. You know, you guys all hear the car sales stories and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I own a diesel truck shop and I sell collector cars and I have a radio show and I also own an event company. Um, you know, I usually get up and make my first cup of coffee and get ready and uh, eat a Pop-Tart, usually on the way to work. Um, not fruit flavored if anybody wants to send any. I made a post on Instagram and I got like 20 boxes of Pop-Tarts, but they're all like cherry flavored. But um, still appreciate it, still. Just no fruit flavors next time. And uh, eat a Pop-Tart, I jam out, I'm a big music guy. You know, um, always jamming out. Um, I get everything rock and rolling at my shop and uh, I start looking for cars online. And, you know, maybe I find a car to flip, so I may run off. And, and one of the cool things about working at the shop is, you know, I can leave and kind of come and go as I need to. So that gives me the opportunity to pick up these cool deals or go find this next odd car, this next car that's going to be the great story on VinWiki. Um, so it's kind of a lot of fun to do that. Um, I check my social media quite a bit. I'm, I'm probably got my phone in my hand more than any teenage girl in the world. Um, you know, even from the courtroom video, I'm always playing around looking at cars online or gas pumps or pinball machines or whatever, you know, just whatever crosses my mind at the time. I do, I usually close the shop up at night. I'm usually, usually the first one there and I'm usually the last one to leave. Um, I also keep a lot of my cars at my shop, so I get to piddle with the cars and, you know, I can you know, tinker, because I still like to get my hands dirty, you know, so it's nice to, to take a break from the 75,000 phone calls I get a day to just, you know, get under the hood of a car or water sand a car or wash one of my cars or, or take one out for a drive to go see a customer or, or something like that. So there's a lot of fun doing that. Um, here lately, been doing a ton of podcast interviews. So usually about twice a week, I have a podcast interview with some podcast or radio station somewhere else in the country. Um, so those are always fun to do. And then usually I film my radio show during the evening. Um, you know, usually we film on, or record rather on Wednesday nights and uh, we record a radio show. And, you know, and that's always a lot of fun to do because I get to do it with my friends. And of course I have the event company on the weekends. So we host car shows all over the place. I just got back from London hosting the largest American car show outside the United States. So that's a lot of fun. And we travel all over the East Coast doing car shows. We always have a blast doing that. 
Um, so that's a lot of fun. I stay on the move and, uh, of course, flipping cars and, and doing, coming down here and aggravating Ed and, you know, just, that's kind of my life, you know, just kind of, kind of kick around, have fun with it. That's, that's the best thing is, is, you know, every day that's my number one goal is to laugh and have fun with it. What is your favorite brand of beer? You know, I don't mind having a beer every once in a while, but not a real big beer drinker. I'm not a real big drinker at all anymore. I think I drank enough in my 20s and early 30s that I decided to give my liver a little bit of a break. And, uh, you know, I've always been able to control myself. And when I see something's becoming a problem for me, I know I need to stop it. You know, my number one goals in life have always been making money and family. And when you're doing something that starts affecting those things, I know I need to make an adjustment. And, you know, staying up all night and drinking all night and working all day is definitely not going to work together well. So I kind of put it down. And like I said, I don't mind going out and having a beer once in a while. But as a rule, it's about one beer and I'm done for two months. So I don't drink a whole lot anymore. Who did you take to prom? Ashley Jones. Um, my prom was going to make me feel really old when I say this was in 1998, or we had an outdoor prom in downtown Greenville at a place called the Carriage House. It's absolutely gorgeous, still is to this day. Matter of fact, just talking about this, that song All My Life with Casey and JoJo starts playing in my head. She had a silver dress, a long silver dress, and I'm dressed like a tall 13-year-old in a tux. And uh, we took my GT Mustang downtown and one of the best memories, and I tell you what's the craziest thing is, like, you know, most teenage guys, you know, their memories getting laid at prom. My memory at prom was worried about my car sitting on the side of the road in downtown Greenville. And how, like, we'd dance, and then I would walk over to the side of the carriage house and look to see if my car was still there. Um, that was what I was really worried about. Ashley was a great girl. Uh, we dated all through high school. Super nice. Um... We still, we laugh all the time about prom and all the after party stuff we used to do. And it was a great time. It was a great time. Glad it's over with though. Rob, please explain what a JC Penny gal is asking for a friend. Sure. You know, JC Penny gal talking about the quick wit was one of those. Um, I love how that term even came about. It was actually the very first VinWiki story, or the very first time I sat down to do VinWiki stories. I don't think it was in the first one, but it was the second one I did. You know, it was just one of those things off the top of my head. You know, it's like J.C. Penny. It's at the mall, but it's not that nice. You know, and and you know, and and I'm kind of doing the whole Southern throw-off thing. You know, I mean, we've got nice stores in the South, but I love to play on that southern thing like that and I always thought that was a funny one so when I call somebody a JC Penny gal she's a nice looking lady Rob do you have any pets actually I do of course everybody remembers Sprocket from my eBay days my little chihuahua I had him all the way up through my first divorce and getting back to the partying thing you know it's kind of hard to keep up with a dog when you spend several nights away from home so um I used to take Sprocket with me to my shop and he would sit in my office. And uh, he was the coolest little three-pound chihuahua ever. And I uh, absolutely loved that little <laughs> And, uh, you know, he's like my little homeboy. But I knew that he was lonely. I mean, I was never around. I was always gone or going out. And um, I went and seen a customer of mine. And I took him with me. And he walks in behind me into my customer's office. And... There was a guy that worked there. He goes, is that your dog? I'm like, what dog? Oh, yeah, that's Sprocket. And Sprocket, you know, if I stopped, he stopped. He just followed me everywhere I went. And he said, my little girl would go absolutely crazy over him. And I said, how old's your daughter, sir? She goes, she's 10 years old. And I knew the guy. I knew where he lived. I knew he was pretty good people. So I actually gave Sprocket to him. Um, a weird thing about Sprocket is that dog followed me everywhere. But he would never sleep like in the bed like dogs like to do. He would always sleep in his dog bed at night. Well, a few weeks later, 
I come back to see my customer, and next thing you know, there's a picture on this guy's desk of his daughter in Sprocket. And he goes, my little girl absolutely loves this dog. He said, he curls up right beside her every night and goes to sleep. I'm like, a little shit. But, you know, actually, that girl now is in college, and Sprocket is, he's got to be 16, 17 years old now and still around. And uh, the last I heard, everything, like, you know, that was, as soon as his daughter hits the door, the first thing she does is grab Sprocket up. So that dog lives a very sheltered life now, and he's very much loved, and, and I'm glad he's got a good home and, and all that stuff. And that's another one of those things that it hurt because I loved my dog, but I knew I couldn't give him the attention he needed. And uh, so that definitely, that, that hurt, but it also made you feel good. Like I did something good. Um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to believe a used car salesman with a heart, I know. Um, but actually, I have a pet now. And, um, and it's, it's so crazy. I didn't have an animal ever since Sprocket for years. And uh, I was getting ready to go to SEMA. And, uh, you know, it was a few days. We're fixing to fly out to Vegas. And keep in mind, this is, you know, right around Halloween. And uh, I'm sitting in my garage, and I'm talking to my friends on the phone. They're going to SEMA with me. They're excited, and we're talking about flights and all the things we're going to do. And I'm sitting in my garage smoking a cigarette, just chatting it up. And it was pitch black outside. And my house has a long driveway coming down to the garage. I've got the garage doors up, the boo thing sitting in my garage. And out of nowhere, a little black kitten runs down my drive driveway from the darkness and runs in my garage and runs under my Chevelle. First response is, get out of here, cat, get it, get, you know, and all this stuff. Well, he stays under the car and I can't swat him away. I'm like, damn it, I got this cat in my garage. And uh, so I'm like, he'll run out here in a minute. So I'm sitting here smoking a cigarette and talking to my friends on the phone and I'm sitting in a little, like a little shop stool in my garage, just, just talking, you know, whatever. And next thing you know, this little black cat runs up and jumps in my lap and curls up. And then I start petting him. Then he starts purring. And the next thing you know, I got a pet. And uh, this black cat's name is Webster. And uh, this little <laughs> follows me around everywhere, almost like Sprocket. Um, it's weird. I hate cats. And it's even funnier is how superstitious everyone in my family is. Like... The whole black cat thing. My grandfather used to X him out going down the road and all that stuff. And to know his grandson has a black cat for a pet. But um, absolutely love that cat. Um, and, and that's the weirdest thing ever. I've never been a cat fan. I still don't like cats. I just like him. But uh, definitely, definitely, definitely a cool, cool pet. And it's kind of cool to say you got a rescue now. It's kind of the end thing. Don't look at me like that. A little black never hurt nobody. Rob, do you have any enemies or even a nemesis? Um, I'm extremely competitive in everything I do. Um, I have got into cuss fights over games of Monopoly. Um, I take everything I do and give it my all. Um, you know, so when it's in sales or a board game or a car show or putting on an event, you know, if I had to step on some toes, it doesn't bother me a bit. So I have pissed a few people off in my life. So I'm sure I've got an enemy or two on my side. But all in all, it's what it takes to win. So that's how I play. When you've had your fill of J.C. Penny gals, what is the next step up? I guess you could go up for a Nordstrom gal, but I warn you, this is expert level stuff right here. This is not entry level. Um, just because you think you can box don't mean you can step in the ring with Ali. And this is probably going to kill your car budget to keep up with a gal of this of this quality. So, you know what? J.C. Penny gals might be the way to stay. If you, Guy Fieri, and Gary Laveau from Rascal Flats walk into the classy chassis, who gets confused for who? <clears throat> I've got a very funny story about me and Gary Laveau from Rascal Flats. This has probably been about 10 years ago. It's when I had the Red Vet. The one on 20s is flared out. Rascal Flats came to 
Greenville, and we're playing at the Bilo Center. They've changed the name of it since then, but that's what I call it. It's still there. And uh, they came there to play. Well, I got very good seats to this concert. And the girl I was dating at the time was a very big Rascal Flats fan. Go figure. But, so we had very good seats. And uh, so here we are, you know, at the concert. And, you know, I drove my bright red vet with the top down. And what was crazy is, is pulling into the Bilo Center. I mean, hell, I know everybody in town. So naturally, I get to park in front of the Bilo Center because I know all the parking guys. And so here I am with this bright red vet and this chubby guy with spiky hair and sunglasses gets out and starts walking up. And I have people start walking up to me. And they'll get pretty close and then they turn around and walk off. And it keeps happening to me all through it. And I'm like, you know, I don't get it. And, you know, I wasn't the biggest Rascal Flats fan. I mean, like, I've heard their music, but I didn't really focus on anything. I never watched any of the videos or whatever. But the girl I was dating was a huge fan. So we had, you know, literally, we're on top of the stage. And uh, we're actually to the left-hand side of the stage, like right there. Where they came in and out, I was standing right there. I mean, I could stand up out of my seat and smack them in the back of the head if I wanted to. That's how close I was. And I'll never forget, they were singing that song, Life is a Highway. Uh, it's like the old Tom Cochran song. They were singing Life is a Highway. And when they finished it out, it had all this stuff going on and pyrotechnics or whatever at the end. And they walk off stage. And me and him make eye contact. And he stops and looks straight at me like, what in the hell? And walks on. Like, you've met your double, bud. Um, another funny Rascal Flatts story. With the Red Vet, I was in Myrtle Beach for the Run to Sun car show that same year. And I was a little bit bigger than I am now. I was, I was about 270 then. Um, we all went out for a night of drinking back in my wilder days. And... Um, we all went out, and there was a bachelorette party, and they kept looking at me and just staring at me. And you know when someone's looking at you. You know when someone's talking about you. And I'm like, yeah, what's going on? Well, finally, this very intoxicated girl with a crown on her head taps me on the shoulder. She goes, you're him. You're damn right I'm him. She's like, oh my God, it's him. And I signed Gary's autograph about 30 times at that bar that night. That was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of fun. I'm sorry, Gary. But um, no offense, I got more followers on Instagram than you do now, so it ain't that big a deal. But uh, his, the autograph got signed in numerous, I signed a few napkins. Maybe, maybe one chest. I was drinking, so I don't know. It was a little blurry at that point. It might have been a, it might have been a forehead. Um, hell, it might have been a leg. I don't know. I signed a lot of things. Um, actually, had that happen one other time in Buckhead. Uh, we were at a bar in Buckhead, and uh, didn't have the red vet with me. But I was at a bar in Buckhead, and I was approached by a army of bachelorettes from a wedding party for a bachelorette party. And I got circled by them and they made me sing Rascal Flats to them. That one, that one blew my cover pretty quick. Um, you know, I joke with people all the time when I first started in radio, everybody tells me, they used to tell me on the radio that I sounded a lot like Matthew McConaughey, but I looked like the guy from Rascal Flats. Talk about being dealt a hand. Why can I look like Matthew McConaughey and sound like the guy from Rascal Flats? Go figure. What are your top three favorite Vin Wiki stories told by someone else? By far, my favorite Vin Wiki story ever is the very first one I ever watched. And the only reason that it was the first one I watched is because the title caught my eye. Oh, Edward has a way of wording his titles to where they catch your attention. And this one, the uh, 
I bought a Lambo from a prostitute. I had to click on it. And that one, he has told that story to me personally. I know at least five times. And I made him do it twice on the radio. I absolutely love that story. Every time he tells me, like, you know, we're in the story biz here, you know, and and and, and there's such things as a story boner. And I want to tell you something. Every time he tells that story, I'm on the edge of my damn seat. I love it. It gets better every time. And I know what's going to happen. But it's like, tell us about the basketball net. Tell us about the hula hoop and taking a break. I love that story. I love that one. That one's one of my favorites by far. You know, I love Casey's videos. I love what he does with Genius Garage. So I like his videos. I love making fun of his really tight shirts. You know, I really like Doug's videos. I, I really do. And, 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 I, and I'm not saying that because he's like four foot tall and wears extra medium shirts. I'm saying it because I really do like his videos. And, uh, and I live to give Doug a hard time. And that's the reason I give him a hard time is because he sent me to trailer park hell to get that damn Mercedes. We will never be even Tiny Dancer. What did you want to be as a kid? You know, I don't want to get sappy on you guys, but I've always wanted to be a salesman. Um, I don't know if it was born into me or whatever like that, but um, like I'll give you a perfect example. And I've actually told this story on the radio before. When I was a kid, what is every young boy's favorite toy? Hot Wheels cars. And what do they do with their Hot Wheels cars? They race them. And they put them on tracks and they run them through the grass and in the driveway and on the floor in the kitchen and bounce them and bang them in each other. But I didn't. I kept my Hot Wheels cars pristine. I'm not like those weirdos that keep them in the packages, but I'm talking about like I took them out. But I kept them pristine and I always kept them wiped off. And you remember those light brights? You know, the thing that you stick the little pegs in? I would make a sign that said, Pitts, use cars. And I would line all my Hot Wheels cars up. I had a desk in my room. And I would line all my Hot Wheels cars up in perfect rows and position them different. And I would play car lot. And that's what I remember doing with my Hot Wheels cars. I remember taking trades. And like negotiating deals with myself on Hot Wheels cars as a kid. So I guess, I guess I was destined to be a salesman, I guess. I mean, that's just, like, I remember that. I just, that's a, uh, that's kind of a sappy rabbit moment, but it's the truth, straight up. If you weren't flipping cars and hosting the radio show, what would you be doing? <sighs> you know, I don't know what I'd be doing. Cars have always been such a major part of my life. The radio show kind of fell in my lap. Um, but, but cars have been such a big part of my life and selling cars that I mean, I don't, I don't, I've never really known no other way. Like I took breaks from selling, you know, cars, you know, I mean, I've went six months. I sound like a drug, like a drug addict. I went six months one time, six months clean, no sales. But it's the truth though. Like, if you got that bug, if you got that addiction, and I mean, it's just like a thrill selling for me. Like, you know, like you're talking to somebody and it just goes from mediocre conversation to, well, I kind of like it. And you talk them into it. And next thing you know, you get them laughing and you get them comfortable. Boy, I would like to have this to, I don't know if I can afford it. Well, I probably could, I'm, I'd do this. And then you go back and forth. I'll take it. I love it. Like, literally, I got cold chills just saying that. I love that. So, I don't know no other thrill. And I mean, like I said, I've never been on drugs. I can only imagine that's the only thing you could compare it to. You know, because for me, that's a thrill. I love to sell. And uh, so, I, I don't know what I... I'd probably work at a 7-Eleven or something if it wasn't for selling cars. Do you get recognized in public a lot? Actually, a lot. When I was in London, I had people coming up to me right and left. Airports, all the damn time. Um, I actually almost missed my plane taking a selfie and signing a shirt for a lady. Whenever I buy milk at the grocery store, apparently the dairy department everywhere is a fan of rabbit. Because whenever I've took more selfies with people 
holding a gallon of milk than I think anybody else in the world. But yeah, so I, I do get recognized a lot and I love it. I love taking pictures with fans and I love answering questions and, and, and sharing car stories. Um, you know, I've met a lot of great people through all this stuff and uh, you know, made a lot of great friends. Um, you know, it's nice to hear people's reactions, like real reactions to things that, that I've said that they took to heart and they've changed about their life. Um, you know, it helped them with their sales or it helped them, you know, get the confidence to go buy their first flip car or, you know what, they took a job in sales because they heard me say how fun it could be. Um, I love that because now you're not a storyteller, you're an influencer and you're motivating people to do things and motivating people to better their life. And, uh, and I like that. I like that a lot. And I mean, and even if nobody takes nothing from what I say and, 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 you know, and, and gets a good laugh out of it, it was worthwhile, but I really love hearing, you know, these young guys that went out and bought their first car and they made money off of it. Like, I love that. I love knowing that I might've helped push that along. So definitely love meeting fans all the time. You know, guys, if you ever see me out anywhere, please come up. I have took selfies eating food uh, anywhere. I actually got approached in the bathroom one time. We didn't take a selfie in there, though. That's, that was my one thing. I did draw the line there. What is your proudest moment in life? You know, I've done a lot of fun stuff. A lot of fun stuff. And um, I've had a lot of great opportunities. And uh, a lot of, a lo I've had a lot of opportunity that a lot of people will never get. And I realize that how fortunate I am. But probably the proudest moment of my life, hands down, out of everything I've done. And I've, and I've done some pretty crazy <laughs> and I'm not going to lie. But um, probably the proudest thing. The proudest moment for me. Um, I do a car show for Hendrix Motorsports, and you know every year it's at Christmas time, and we raise money for the Shriners, and you know I charge them nothing. I work literally in freezing cold temperatures all day long. You know we're we got all the speakers set up. We're playing music. You know we're announcing, and you know I'm walking out with a wireless mic and working the crowd over. Then we go into the big auditorium they have there at Hendrix, and we do you know a live auction. And and you know I love to get them riled up. So I'll walk out there with a wireless mic, and I'll walk out in the audience. And I mean I will do anything I can to get money out of you to raise money for these kids, because I love helping kids. I don't have any kids of my own. And, you know, I think that's kind of like a soft spot for me a little bit. And, you know, it was really, really, really funny. We had some kids there from the Shriners Hospital that were up on stage, and I got to introduce them, and, you know, and we're doing all this before the award ceremony, and we did this live auction. We raised like $20,000 in just a few hours at this live auction, you know, and, and I'm over here just talking, and I'm hoarse. I've been talking so much at this point. And, um, uh, there was a little girl there. Um, her arm was was messed up. I don't remember exactly what was wrong with it. And she got up on stage and she was telling her story. And um, you know, and and I looked and I kind of stood back and I looked over. And my dad came with me to the car show. He'd never been. And uh, I actually conned him into going. I said, "I tell you what, I'm going to get you into Rick Hendrick's personal collection, and we're going to walk around and look at his Corvettes. But you're going to freeze your ass off of this car show with me first. And he came, and you know, my dad was hesitant, and he complained the entire time he was there. <laughs> to moan the entire day. God, it's cold. I'm freezing my ass off the entire time. We're in the auditorium. We've been doing all this stuff. I'm sweating like a hooker in Sunday service without a songbook. You know, and I'm over here hoarse, can barely talk, and, uh, you know, just, just pumped. And, uh, I look over and my dad's standing over to the side and he's crying. He's teared up crying. And, uh, you know, my dad's not that guy, even remotely. You know, my dad's the macho drag racing, you know, all this stuff guy. And, uh, and it, was, it was just, it, it struck me because I'd never seen my dad cry before like that, ever. 
um, you know, funerals, anything. And that's, that really let me know, like, hey, I'm doing something right, you know. And, of course, I did what we usually do as father and son. I said, suck it up, you big pussy. And went back on stage and finished up the show. But, um, great event. I do it every year. Uh, Christmas for Kids car show at the Hendrix. At the Hendrix uh, race. Man, that joke, I can't even finish that. Um, at Hendrix Motorsports in Concord, North Carolina. You definitely need to check it out. They're online. It's a great show. You don't want to miss it. It goes to a great cause. Um, next question before I get sappy. You seem so cool, calm, and collected. Do you believe in God, and what is your religious affiliation? Yes, I do believe in God. Um, I was raised in a Southern Baptist church. I actually went to church every Sunday with my grandmother, who prays for me every night still. Um, every time she sees me, she tells me she's worried about me. Um, grew up in a very strict Southern Baptist household, actually. Um, my mom and dad were a little lax with it. They weren't quite as bad as she was. I'll never forget, she actually gave me a whooping for having a deck of playing cards because they're the devil. And then later on, I'm reading Doyle Bronson's book, Super System. But anyway, I'm not a perfect Christian by any stretch of the imagination, but you know what? I've read through that book a few times, and I don't think any of us are a perfect Christian, actually. Um, all you can do is try to live as good as you can. Um, so I'm definitely not one to disciple to anybody or anything like that. But yes, I do believe in God. And I was raised in a Southern Baptist church. I'll never forget, I actually got a Bible for my grandmother for Christmas. I hadn't read it in months. And there was like a church camp during the summer. And if you, if you learned a certain amount of Bible verses, you could go for free to this church camp. And I wanted to go. So I was sitting in my room trying to memorize these Bible verses. And, uh, my dad walks into my room and he sees me reading the Bible and accused me of looking for loopholes. But of course, there again, that's, that's how me and my dad are. And, uh, that's just another fun dad moment. What's the best car to pick up chicks? Drop top Corvette, red in color. Can't miss. Um, I just think there's something about a Corvette that attracts women. I don't know. I don't know if there's an aphrodisiac in fiberglass. But I, mean, I don't know how the exotic car thing works. I don't know how it works for them. But I don't know. For me, America's sports car always did the trick for the J.C. Penny gals. What's the most redneck thing you have done? I've done a lot of redneck things in my life. And I, and, I, and I like to consider myself one of the classier of the redneck bunch. I really do. I grew up in a very rough trailer park as a young child. My parents later moved into a home, and, and, and it got better when the money came. But starting out, my parents were dead broke and, and, you know, whatnot. It was so funny. My dad always had a Corvette, had a Corvette, you know, ever since I was two, he's had a Corvette. And, uh, you know, we lived in a single wide trailer in a ratty trailer park but my dad owned a Corvette priorities and uh, probably one of the more redneck things I remember is I remember riding to church sitting in my mother's lap and I'm probably five or six and I was kind of a fat kid anyway sitting in my mother's lap in a Corvette driving to church and this is the part now keep in mind now if you've done this now in 2019, they would put your ass under the jail. But sitting in my mother's lap, and the only thing that my dad had to say to me, don't touch my dash. Parenting done right, kids. Uh, that one's got to be up there in the most redneck things I've done. That's, that's, that's pretty high up on the list. I'll be honest with you, if, if it's any higher than that, I probably don't want to admit it. I was probably wearing, I think I was wearing my little white Easter outfit. What's your favorite brand of shades and why? Oakley. Um, actually, it's a funny story with Oakley sunglasses. Um, I've had a pair of Oakley sunglasses on my head practically every day of my life since I was 19 years old. Um, 
I bought my very first pair of Oakley sunglasses in Myrtle Beach on spring break. And ever since then, I've always had a fascination with overpriced plastic. I've ordered several pairs. I have several hundred pairs of Oakleys now. Um, probably, probably about six years ago, um, I ordered a pair of custom Oakley sunglasses. You know, you can customize them online and order a custom pair. Well, they, they called to survey me about Oakley sunglasses. So, my girlfriend was in the mall. I'm sitting in a car killing time. Hey, I'll take a survey for a free pair of sunglasses. Mr. Pitts, how often do you wear Oakley sunglasses? I said, every day. She said, so, two or three times a week? Twice a week? Once a week? I said, every day. She's like, okay. So, Mr. Pitts, how many pairs of Oakley sunglasses do you have? And I said, about 150. She's like, wow. She said, so back to the question. So you wear Oakley sunglasses every day? I said, every day of my life. I said, since I was 19 years old, I've had a pair of Oakley sunglasses on my head, rain or shine, night or day. I have been married twice, divorced twice with Oakley sunglasses on my head. Every funeral I've ever been to in my life was with a pair of Oakley sunglasses on my head. I said, I wear them every day. I said, I literally only take them off for three things and they all start with S. And I said, I'll let you fill in the blanks yourself. And this lady at this point is laughing her off. She's like, do you mind? This is recorded. Do you mind if I share this? And I'm like, I don't care. Mail me my free glasses. Well, I get an email and another, another phone call from Oakley. And uh, they actually used some of my information and some pictures with me in the cars for an advertising campaign called One Icon. And I got a lot of free stuff. Well, I started sending them pictures of all the, of all the Oakleys. And I said, hell, I even have an Oakley display case. And the guy was talking about, how in the hell did you get that? I work here and can't get one. I'm like, you got to know people. Yeah, so that was that was really cool. And so I've always been a big fan of Oakley sunglasses. I actually, the problem I have now is, is I own literally one of everything, at least. And I own my favorite. Now, these aren't whole brooks, but um, hell, I got to look and see what these are. These or these are catalysts, and I like these. I like the Wayfair style glasses, but I love the whole brooks, and I've got probably twenty pairs of those. But the craziest thing is, out of all the sunglasses I've got from them, and like I've got leather bound books, like these Oakley books they send out to like representatives and stuff that they send me, and like all this crazy insider Oakley stuff, and I got the watches and all that stuff. But like. Out of all the pairs of Oakleys I've got, I mean, I've got, you know, over the tops and, you know, the, the race back ones and the limited edition ones. And I got a pair of rose gold ones they only made four of and all this. And I've got all these odd glasses. I wear like the same three pairs over and over again. And the three that I wear are probably the cheapest of all of them I own. And I like those the best. But... Always been a big fan of Oakley Shades. My old man is a big fan of Oakley Shades. It all started with him stealing my sunglasses, and I pretty much stocked him up too. What is the advice you would give a car or non-car related salesperson to change how they look at life? You know, it's really, really easy to get down to the dumps in sales. No matter how good of a salesman you are, if the crowd's off, if nobody's there, you can't sell cars, you know? So there's a lot of variables to it. So it's easy to get down in the dumps about it. Or you see people getting into sales and they're, you know, well, I only made a couple hundred dollars on this car. And I get that question all the time from people. They're down in the dumps. Well, I must not be good at this. I only made $500. And this is what I tell them. Do you realize if you made $1 off the car you sold, you've done something that two-thirds of America can't do. And that's actually make money off an automobile. Because what do they do with their cars? They trade them in. When you trade them in, you're losing every time. Guaranteed. No matter what they tell you, you're losing. And you've done something that two-thirds of America can't do. You've made money off an automobile. And so, you know, that right there puts you at the top of the class in my book. 
And at the end of the day, you know, everybody hears us bragging about the home runs and the big, the big sales and, you know, selling Prevost motor homes or big money hot rods or selling cars to porn stars. But at the end of the day, we all talk about our home runs. But the base hits, this $1,500, $2,000, $3,000 sales is what pays the bills. Because those are what happens most common. Just like those base hits is what usually wins the game, not the home runs. That's only in storybooks. And I remind people of that, you know, to keep your head up and keep keep trudging along. Because you, you will hit that big deal. It's, it's inevitable. You're going to hit it. You know, I take sales a little closer to heart than most people. I mean, you know, people really look down at car salesmen sometimes, but... You know, just like I said before, you know, you've got to hone your craft. You know, no book's going to tell you how to sell. You know, you've got to figure it out for yourself. You've got to find your own technique in your own way. You know, the way Ed sells cars or the way Rob sells cars or the way Doug sells cars. Everybody sells differently. Everybody has different techniques. You know, I love to make them laugh. You know, I mean, and that, that's always been my thing. Um, one of my favorite sayings ever um, and I use this one all the time. If you can make somebody laugh, you can damn near make them do anything. And the first, I know somebody's already saying bullshit and whatever. All right. I have done some deals that you never would have ever thought I would have ever pulled off because I can make them laugh. Because when you make somebody laugh, they're comfortable. And when somebody's comfortable, they're going to deal with you. Because they're not dealing with a salesman now. Someone that makes them laugh isn't a salesman. Someone that makes them laugh is their friend. And comfort is the key. And I'm sure Ed will agree with me. Anybody that sells. When your buyer's comfortable, smooth selling. So, you know, that's always been my thing. But maybe yours is the stats. Or, you know, being extra witty. Um, you know, being a shrewd negotiator. But, uh, but yeah, you know, so, so keep your head up, you know, and, and, and stay positive about it. Like you got to stay in your zone. But, uh, I think that's the number one thing I can say to anybody in sales is, uh, you know, to stay motivated. Like I said, you know, better days are coming and, uh, you know, keep selling. That's the best thing to do. You know, that's how, that's how you get better at it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. I mean, Lord knows, ask any of my wives, they'll tell you. The longer, you're, the longer you go at it, the better you get. Anyway, guys, I want to thank you all for watching and putting up with me for the next hour. Um, I want to thank Ed for having me on VinWiki. I love this channel. Um, guys, keep the questions. Hit the subscribe button. I'm going to pull. I'll pull to Varish. Do the point. Hit the subscribe button, guys, if you like it. Click the bell, whatever. Whatever you do. I don't know. I'm not a YouTuber like that. But anyway, guys, thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Are you looking to buy your dream car? Premier Financial Services offers the flexibility of financing with the tax benefits of leasing. The PFS Simple Lease offers quick approvals and easy termination when you are ready for the next car. Visit our website and follow us for more.